following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. I'm Bill Cachetis, your host on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. When President of the National Baseball Hall of Fame, Jeff Idelson, announced the class of 2019 yesterday, it was a bittersweet moment for Phillies fans. Our very own Roy Halladay, in his first year of eligibility, was among the four former MLB players elected by the baseball writers, the others being relief pitcher Mariano Rivera of the New York Yankees, designated hitter Edgar Martinez of the Seattle Mariners, and right-hander Mike Messina, who pitched for the Baltimore Orioles and Yankees. Halliday, who split his career between Toronto and Philadelphia, is regarded by many as the most dominant pitcher of his era. Between 2002 and 2011, Doc, as he was called by teammates and fans, won two Cy Young Awards and finished in the top five for that award seven times. He was first in complete games with 20 and shutouts with 68, second in earned run average, second in innings pitched, and fourth in strikeouts. An eight-time All-Star, Halliday in 2010 also threw a perfect game and the second no-hitter in postseason history. His career totals include 203 major league victories, 2,117 strikeouts, and a 3.38 ERA. Sadly, Doc was killed in an amphibious plane crash in the Gulf of Mexico on November 7, 2017, and will be sorely missed at Cooperstown on Sunday, July 21st, when the induction ceremonies will be held. Here to discuss Roy Halladay's career is Rich Doobie, his pitching coach, with the Phillies. Welcome to the podcast, Rich. Well, thank you. Rich, when, when Doc's name is mentioned, the, the first thing that comes to mind for teammates was his extraordinary work ethic. It seems that he never took his major league career for granted, especially after a disastrous second year uh, with the Blue Jays when his ERA ballooned to over 10 and he agreed to return to the minors to rebuild his delivery. Tell us about Doc's work ethic when he came to Philadelphia uh, after the 2009 season. Well, it was tremendously detailed. Um, you know, there's all kinds of stories uh, of Doc being in the clubhouse before 5 o'clock in the morning in spring training, and they're all real. Um, he was the first to show up. But he had a plan every time he came in the clubhouse door. Um, he had to get something accomplished that day, whatever routine or uh, regimen he had scheduled, and he was so diligent and so uh, devoted to it that nothing ever got in its way. Um, you know, he, he'd get his heart, you know, do his cardio, get his heart rate way up, and then he'd wander off and do some arm exercises, and then he'd come back and get his heart rate up on doing some more cardio, and then he'd go over and do some shoulder exercises. And he was just, uh, for a couple hours straight, he was just in constant motion, and and nobody messed with him and nobody tried to get in his way because uh, you weren't going to disturb the workout. That was the number one priority that day. And once he accomplished uh, his goal, then he was the greatest teammate to be around because he'd talk, talk to everybody afterwards and, and give advice and, and listen. He was a great listener and uh, just a tremendous teammate also. You know, uh, it was that work ethic but also his humility that Cole Hamill's talked about recently on the MLB channel um, when they interviewed him on, on Roy. And he said that, that Doc taught him how to prepare for games by, by watching video, by teaching him how to attack hitters, and by working with him to improve his cut fastball. And Hamels also said that Doc was one of the most modest people he ever knew, that he never talked about himself. Uh, most he, he conversed about uh, in terms of, of personal life was his son's. Uh, and his love of, of model airplanes, and that helped to keep the, the clubhouse loose. Um, and, and I'm sure other pitchers, you know, felt that way too. Would it be accurate to say that Halliday served as a surrogate pitching coach for you? Oh, I think a lot of veteran pitchers uh, served that for pitching coaches. Um, you know, they've, they've been mentored by people before them. I think Doc might have been around Pat Hankin and, couple other guys over there and uh you know chris carpenter who he's close very very close friends with over there in toronto and i think most uh 
most guys that hang around the big leagues and have extended careers have some type of mentor before them and uh the real good ones and the real good teammates always want to always want to carry that on and lead on the the next group of young pitchers but doc was uh as probably as selfless as any player you could ever imagine uh, he threw his perfect game there in Miami, and the first thing, first words out of his mouth was, you know, Chooch was great tonight. Uh, again, giving all, the, giving all the credit to Chooch and his pitch selection and his call on the game and everything. And um, he was always deflecting and giving credit to his teammates instead of taking any of it on on himself. And um, you know, that's that was the type of person he was. Uh, he's he was just so. Um, you know, he's a Hall of Famer, but so unassuming and just uh, so down to earth. Mm-hmm. The, the few times that I interviewed him, he struck me as a real student of the game. I mean, he swore by Harvey Dorfman's book, The Mental ABCs of Pitching, and uh, he talked about Mel Queen, who was one of his pitching coaches uh, in Toronto when he, he, um, he agreed to go back down um, to the minors after disastrous 2000 uh, season. And uh, apparently Queen suggested that he change his arm slot from straight over the top to three quarters to stay closed longer to hide the ball and to add, I guess it was a sinker, maybe a slider to his repertoire so he could keep the ball lower in his strike zone. Um, you know, did you see that same kind of attention to mechanics when, when he came to Philadelphia? Or had he experienced so much success with that delivery by that point that he didn't bother tinkering with it because he really seemed to me to be kind of compulsive about, um, you know, the mental aspects and the mechanics. Well, um, he, he picked up Harvey Dorfman by his wife, Brandy, really. Mm-hmm. Um, when he was struggling with Toronto, um, Harvey Dorfman was uh, working with the Oakland A's and he later worked with the Florida Marlins and the Tampa Bay Devil Rays and, uh, a few other teams, um, and was well known through the baseball circuit um, as a phenomenal sports psychologist. And and Brandy was the guy. Brandy was the one I should say that really pushed Doc to get the book and then get in contact with Harvey, and and it really turned his mental side of the game all completely around. Uh, Mel Queen turned it around with changing his arm slot, um, making him a sinker cutter type pitcher instead of a four-seam overhand curveball guy that he was out of high school with a phenomenal arm. But um, when he got to the big leagues, it didn't equate to success right away. And, you know, there are only so many people that could have gone down and, and done what Doc did. Um, mm-hmm. First of all, you got to, he had to have that mental toughness to, to go down and revamp himself, um, to change his arm slot, to change a little bit of the turn in his delivery and be committed to it. And then, uh, not only, you know, start the season in extended spring training where there's a bunch of young kids and just trying to get it, get to A ball. Well, after he had gotten it down pat, they sent him to A ball. I think double A, triple A. He had to work himself all the way back to the major leagues. And, uh, it took a, a tremendous amount of courage and, and mental discipline to do that. Um, you know, and, and fortunately he had, uh, you know, Brandy kind of motivated him going to see Harvey and Harvey was, uh, the right guy at the right time, uh, and has done. He had done tremendous work with a lot of pitchers in Major League Baseball. Mm-hmm. You mentioned um, his his perfect game, or maybe it was a no hitter. Um, Doc is just one of 23 pitchers in the history of Major League Baseball to throw a perfect game. Uh, of course, that came on May 29th, uh, 2010, against the Marlins in Florida. Memories of that game, um, aside from the fact that he credited Chooch with, with that success? Yeah, you know, I, you know, and it's, it may sound crazy to say, but I don't think he was really that sharp that day. I think he, he might have had, uh, I don't know, somewhere between five and seven three ball counts. And Doc very, very seldom had three balls to a hitter because his mindset was to get rid of a hitter and be done with him within three pitches. Um, but I think he had a he, – he really wasn't particularly sharp command-wise that day. Um and not that they hit anything hard off them. Uh, uh, it, it was, you know, again, a perfect game. You, you can't really scuff at too many perfect games. But I thought his no-hitter in the playoffs was uh, 
probably light years above his perfect game in the in the regular season. I thought his uh, no hitter in the playoffs against Cincinnati. He he might have been able to pitch uh, until the next morning, and they wouldn't have gotten a hit off him. His stuff was so phenomenal. His command and his uh, ability to command and repeat his delivery was just so sensational that I think we could have stayed there for a long, long time before they ever got a hit off him. Yeah, he he threw. I believe he threw 104 pitches in that four nothing no hit victory, and the only bump in the road was the fifth inning walk to Jay Bruce, um, Bruce yeah. and and that feat uh, for listeners marked the second postseason no hitter in MLB history. The first was a perfect game thrown by the Yankees Don Larson in the 1956 World Series. Um, yeah, you know, looking and watching that game, every pitch had a purpose. Every pitch had a purpose. If you looked at the way he set up the hitters uh, and, and went about his business. Uh, and then, of course, Ruiz ended that uh, uh, game with that sensational play right in front of home plate to save the whole thing. And and uh, Doc was you know, just so exuberant talking about Chooch after that game. I remember that. But, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wonderful game. Um what speaking of Chooch, uh, when when Roy won his second Cy Young Award in 2010, he had a replica plaque made for Chooch because he said that he couldn't have done it without him. What made the two of them so successful, aside from being on the same page as far as pitch selection was concerned? Uh, you know, you know when we went into a a game planning session before would you know, Doc and myself and Chooch would meet and Doc had his information on the opposing team and I had mine and we'd discuss it with Chooch and, and Chooch would have his ideas about certain hitters that he knew pretty well and I think it was, you know, what really bonded the two is Doc saw Chooch's commitment to the pitching staff as a whole, not only to Doc, but to to the twelve guys or eleven guys, whatever we had at that time, but um, the commitment that Chooch made to to bring out the best in all of uh, the guys on that staff, and and for Doc Halliday, it wasn't about uh, you know looking pretty or doing this or doing that. It was about winning. Uh, this guy wanted to win a World Series as bad as anybody I've ever been around. Um, unfortunately, we did not get there, but it wasn't because of uh, a lack of effort. But I think he saw in Chooch a guy with uh, just a, uh, almost the selflessness that Doc had. Uh, of giving himself all up um, for his teammates and trying to win um, every ball game every night, and I think that's what really bonded the two, and I think that's what uh, probably Doc appreciated the most in Chooch. Mm-hmm. You know, the last memory I have of Roy Halladay came when a cameraman panned to him in the dugout after the Phillies lost the 2011 L- L- uh, NLDS to the St. Louis Cardinals. He was standing there looking out onto the field, uh, watching the cards celebrate. But to me, he appeared to be stunned and perhaps thinking that that was his last chance to get a World Series ring. As it turned out, it was. Uh, Roy's arm began to give him problems the following season, and his career was effectively over after 2013. Um, How difficult was it for him to retire? Um. I don't know how difficult it was for him to retire. He he exhausted all chances to make a comeback between the shoulder and the bad back and you know, two injuries that he was really suffering from. Uh, most guys probably wouldn't have tried to pitch with the injuries he had at that time mm-hmm. uh, in 13. Um, but, again, this guy was uh, as accountable to his contract, to the fans, to Major League Baseball, to the game of baseball as uh, anybody you can ever imagine. So, um, he tried to pitch in 13, and I think, um, you know, it, he finally realized that the arm wasn't coming back. The, the back did not allow him to get in the same position delivery-wise. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, health issues that, was gonna, that were going to keep him from ever being uh, as great as he once was. So um, walking away from the game, I think he was uh, – I think he's probably set for it uh, because he realized the health issues and he has uh, two phenomenal boys that uh, he wanted to spend time with and and get involved in coaching and get involved in mentoring young pitchers with the Phillies or the Blue Jays. And uh, he was headed in that direction with both. Mm -hmm. 
do you think he would have ended up after, let's say, his sons, um, you know, grew up, left home? Do you think he would have ended up back in baseball as a pitching coach? I don't know that he would have been a pitching coach. Um, I think he liked, because his relationship with Harvey Dorfman and what he went through to develop the, the mental toughness that he developed, and to see that um, the importance of it, um, and it was something that a whole lot of people don't get into and discuss. And uh, I think Doc was really wanting to devote himself to the mental side of the game and be more of a um, baseball, probably psychologist, and probably really probably leaning more towards the pitching side. But he could have handled hitters too. Uh, he could have talked hitters down from down from the ledge and worked with them and and straightened them out also. So I think he would have probably stayed more on the mental side of the game than he would have uh, in the trenches and, and being a pitching coach. Mm-hmm. Last question. I'm wondering what kind of legacy he left. I I look at Halliday and yet uh, and another pitcher I followed very carefully when he was with the Phillies, Steve Carlton. They seem to be you know, bookends. Uh, Carlton was a left-hander, um, but like uh, Roy, very competitive, very much into the mental aspects of pitching, uh, complete game artist. Of course, Carlton had 300-some wins. Uh, Roy had, what, 203. Um, but it was a different era. Um, oh, absolutely. You know, I... He, where will this guy stand when it's all said and done in, you know, the in the long line of of, uh, of pitching? An anomaly for the time period in which he played, uh, or do- every bit as dominant as those guys that came before, like Gibson, Carlton, um, you know, Ryan, people like that. Well, I think probably for the for the stretch of his uh, healthy career, he was as dominant as anybody. Uh, you know, he spent a lot of years pitching in that American League East uh, with the powerhouses of the Red Sox and, um, you know, the Yankees. And even the Orioles at some time were pretty good teams. And, in fact, the Phillies, I think, beat uh, Tampa Bay one year in the World Series. So they, they were pretty good, too. So that, that American League East was a pretty good division. Um, and he did a lot of his, a lot of his work in that, in that division. And he was uh, the, the most dominant guy probably for a 10-year stretch. But um, you know he was he was so impressive that when he started the game he planned on finishing the game. He wanted the ball the first pitch. He wanted the ball the last pitch. Um, his goal was to get it done as fast as he could with uh, with limited wasted pitches. And um, I think his career games will will stand for a long time now. The way the game's being shaped and formed and and built around bullpens and, and the starting pitches of four or five innings. I don't know that he could exist in today's game. Uh, the analytics he could deal with very easily. He was always a guy that, again, he had his game plan. He watched video, and, you know, he, he really wanted to know where to go on hitters and where he could go and where he should stay away from. I also I always said that I think the best way to beat uh, Roy Halladay would have been to bring up nine minor leaguers that he's never seen. Um, <laughs> again, he – this guy was like a, he was like any good student going into a major exam. He had done his homework, he had done his prep, and that gave him the that gave him the comfort and the commitment to all his all the pitches he was about to throw. But when he uh, faced somebody that he did not know, he did not know what his swing looked like, what his approach looked like, where he might be vulnerable, uh, that threw Doc off his game a little bit. Uh, he was a guy that uh, needed the info to have that uh, reassurance. Um, but again, there's there's not going to be too many guys completing games like Roy Halladay, and and not not too many guys probably doing it with the class that he he did it with, and and again the deflection of the credit to his teammates and um, the fans and the organization. Well, we were certainly fortunate to have Roy Halladay in a in a Phillies uniform for the last very last part of his career, and we're also fortunate to have you, Rich, working with that pitching staff. Thanks for all you did during the uh, last glory era of Phillies baseball, and thanks for being with us on the podcast. All right. I appreciate it. Maybe those glory days will come back up there. All right. Thank you, Philly fans, for tuning in. See you next week for another podcast of Philadelphia baseball, past, present, and personal. 
This is Bill Cachetis, rounding third and heading home on the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. The proceeding was a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Thank you for listening.